So, in lesson 58, part 10, we're looking at the wrist hinge or the wrist cock in detail. We've looked at the shoulder coil, we've looked at forearm rotation, we're now looking at wrist cock or wrist hinge. Now, for those senior golfers amongst you, of which I count myself one, age of 50 upwards, I could basically, blindf you could blindfold me and give me a row of golfers and if you let me feel their forearms, I'm going to get their age within five, five years, I reckon. So it's like your eyesight or your hairline receding or whatever, we go through physiological changes as we get older and the one that golfers succumb to is reluctance to hinge the wrists. If you look at the golf things that have lasted, Bobby Jones, Sam Snead, Tom Watson, Ernie Els, the swings that have longevity have a flow of wrist hinge. Now the trouble is, when we're under pressure and under, under, under stress on the golf club, tension attacks the wrists first and it's a killer. And it's counterintuitive. You think, Luther, if I hinge my wrists, I'll be less accurate. No, you won't. You'll be more accurate. So going back to first principles, we recognize that by tipping from the hip to build the grip, the left thumb locates parallel to the shaft right of center. Now, you'll notice that the pressure of my thumb is in the pad. It's a disaster if the joint of the thumb is resting on the rubber. It's the thumb pad that you need to be resting. Okay? So, if you hold the club the way the good Lord made you, as you know, you will get 90 degrees of wrist cock or wrist hinge. If I allow the thumb to extend by even an inch, I then achieve 135 degrees of wrist cock. And again, lots of you lady viewers with a long thumb will overswing. And that's simply because your left thumb is unsupported because it's too long. We need the left thumb to be neat and in the pad. Now, if the left thumb is correctly placed, the right hand marries it absolutely perfectly. So, wrist hinge at the top of the backswing is broadly a 90 degree angle between the shaft and the forearm. But let me just show you a comparison between, say, the sand iron and the driver. You see, with a wedge, which is the shortest club, with my sand iron, the shortest club, can you see how big this angle is? So with a wedge, I have to find the most wrist hinge in the least amount of time. So that actually gives me a swing like a Ferris wheel, and it makes me very accurate. If you then look at a driver, look how much longer the driver is. You get most of your wrist hinge before you even start. So the contradiction is that with the driver, you have the least amount of wrist hinge in the most amount of time. So have you got that? Wedges swing on an upright plane, and therefore they tend to have wrist cock. The driver swings on a flatter plane, and the wrist hinge is diminished, and the forearms are activated. So the club maker, who gives you the 13 long clubs, is very clever at changing the mix of the golf swing. So I'll just rest my driver there. Here I am with the explainer in a fairly upright setting. So you can see I'm going to find a lot of wrist hinge, in the least amount of time, but I'm in the plane. Now, my driver doesn't live on the same plane. It lives back here somewhere. You'd think it's strange if my driver was up there. You know the driver is on a flatter plane. This angle is much decreased. So all I'm doing is I'm finding a little bit of wrist hinge at the top, but can you see how much my forearms have rotated? You see, I want to hit a fairway with the driver. It's a big movement with loads of forearm rotation. If I go with a wedge, it's more upright and wristy. So, your job is to, mi to mix wrist hinge to shoulder turn. It's the club maker's job to vary the amount that the wrist hinge has in the swing. You're going to be short, upright and wristy with a wedge. You're going to be long, flat, non-wristy and quite rolly with the driver. But, the same principle applies. The shoulder turn is 90 degrees and the wrist hinge at the top is also 90. If you want to hit a low shot, of course, you don't use your wrists so much. And if the ball needs to go higher, then you activate your wrists more quickly. But whether the wrists are active or passive, they still will live within the swing plane. So let me demonstrate how the wrists work with, with a wedge. Off in the club, lean forward, quite extreme posture, and narrow stance. So as my shoulder goes to my throat, I'm happy to let my wrist have 90 degrees of wrist hinge. So here we go. I blend the backswing. I hinge, 
and I re-hinge. So if I turn to you, you can see that the wrist hinge has reoccurred. So we acquire wrist cock, we dispense it, and we acquire it again. The shoulder and the wrist hinge are always working in sync. So basically, the higher the shot required, the more wrist hinge you need. So if I had to go over some trees, the swing plane would be the same. I would just cock my wrist earlier and release them more quickly. And I've sort of increased the flight of the ball by about 25% in terms of trajectory. So it stands to reason that if I play a shot with no wrists, the ball is going to go lower. So here we go. Wedge with no wrists. The length of the swing is reduced and the ball goes the same distance but probably goes 30% lower than the shot that had the wrist mechanism. Remember also that when you're playing, either you get tired or you get tense, tension will always come up the shaft like rust. And the wrists and the forearms, the shoulders, the neck, and then the body. You won't see somebody with soft, comfortable forearms and a tense neck. Tension starts in the grip, goes into the wrist and the forearms, and then into the body. So, a couple of deep breaths, get yourself together and decide, even when you're under pressure, to be creative. So here we go, 90 shoulder, 90 wrists, blend. There's full wrist hinge, I'm now free to release. And it's amazing that, that creativity manifests not just as power, but also as accuracy.